In this video, we will talk about photoprotection. Photoprotection is also known as non-photochemical quenching. So first of all, we will give you a short introduction, uh, and then we will highlight uh, the biodiversity of different antenna complexes, and we will discuss the different uh, MPQ mechanisms uh, involved in these diff different uh, antenna complexes. Now, as you may know, photosynthetic organisms need light for growth uh, and to survive. And you would think that the more light you give them, the more biomass you would produce. Uh, however, this is not the case. So if we, if we give them more light, it doesn't mean that we also get more biomass, but it actually looks a little bit more like this. So this is the practical amount of biomass that, it, that we produce. And that is because of non-photochemical quenching. And non-photochemical quenching is important because too much light can actually be damaging for these photosynthetic organisms. Now, this here I will tr try to explain you why. So first of all, if you have a photon, it excites a chlorophyll and this excited state can either go to photochemistry or it can re-emit uh, via fluorescence. Uh, however, in high light, uh, there are a lot of photons and we also get a lot of chlorophyll excited states. And the problem is that these excited states uh, are, cannot all be converted via, cannot all be used for photochemistry or used for fluorescence. And what happens is that the excited states remain very long on the chlorophylls and they can, via intersystem crossing, become chlorophyll triplet states. These chlorophyll triplet states react with oxygen to form singlet oxygen. And this is a very dangerous um, component because it's very damaging for the DNA and for the protein and in the end your organism will die from this. And therefore, uh, photosynthetic organisms have developed a sort of an escape valve, uh, also called as a non-photochemical quenching. And this would mean that the reactive oxygen species are not produced. So, as you can see, there's one factor really constant in this, and that's the fluorescence. And the fluorescence is um, also actually very measurable. So from this uh, fluorescence, we can get information about all the other factors in this scheme. We can get information on the photochemistry, we can get information on non-photochemical quenching, and we can even get information on uh, the damaging effects of the reactive oxygen species. So it's important to know that fluorescence is, is normally used as a, as a measurement for all these kind of things. Non-photochemical quenching uh, has, has many different components in order to protect the organism. And one of the, these components is energy quenching. It's a very fast uh, component, and it's the dissipation of the excess energy as heat. Today we will learn a bit more about this. Other factors which are a bit slower are, for example, state transitions. Uh, we have also chloroplast movements. Uh, these are quite slow. And we have the slowest relaxation, which is the um, inhibition. So this is caused by the uh, damage um, or activated by the, rea uh, by the reactive oxygen species. Many different kinds of antenna complex have been developed by different organisms during the evolution. So for example, in green sulfur bacteria, the light is harvested by chlorosomes and then transferred through the FMO protein to the photosystem. In cyanobacteria, the light is harvested by the phycobilisomes. And plants and green algae have light harvesting complexes in the tilakoid membranes. Therefore, along with the different kinds of uh, antenna complexes, these different kind of uh, organisms have developed also different kind of uh, photoprotective mechanism. In cyanobacteria, under la low light conditions, the light is harvested by the phycobilism and is mainly transferred to the photosystem for photochemistry. At the level of this phycobilism, the photoprotective mechanisms take place. This photoprotection in cyanobacteria is carried out by the orange carotenoid protein, or OCP. This protein at low light remains in the inactive cloak conformation. But if the light intensity increases, this OCP can be photoactivated into the reductive form. This reductive form is able to bind the phycobilism and induce the dissipation of the energy as heat, inducing the non photochemical quenching and decreasing the energy arriving to the photosystem. Finally, if the light intensity decreases, 
Another protein called FRP help the OCP to detach from the phycoblisomes and also restore the full harvesting-like capacity of the phycoblisomes. Green sulfur bacteria are strictly anaerobic bacteria. In these bacteria, under relaxing conditions, the photosynthesis capacity is maximum, but under oxidized conditions, there is a dissipation of the energy. This dissipation of the energy takes place at the level of the chlorosomes and at the level of the FMO protein. In the chlorosomes, the energy is dissipated by an uh, oxidized kinon. And at the level of the FMO protein, the dissipation is carried out by an uh, oxidized cysteine. MPQ in plants and green algae is a little bit different. So, um, first of all, we know that in photosynthesis, we get a, a proton gradient across the, the membrane here. However, if we are in high light, this uh, proton gradient um, is increased because the photosystems are constantly active. And this increased uh, proton gradient, delta pH, uh, actually is the uh, activator of non-photochemical quenching. So here we see a schematic of this. If we have high light, we get an increased delta pH and we get the an an activation of non-photochemical quenching. However, there's two different mechanisms are two different proteins responsible for the activation of delta pH. In algae we have LHCSR and in plants we have PSPS. Now the main difference between these two proteins is that LHCSR contains pigments while PSPS does not. You might ask, but why is that interesting? Well, actually it's one of the most important differences because pigments are very important uh, for the actual quenching. So we don't know the precise mechanisms yet. There is a lot. Of, there are a lot of theories about this, and um, I wouldn't want to burn my hands on these. Um, but we know that pigments are involved in this. So pigments are involved in quenching. That means that LHCSR can actually be the site of quenching, where the quenching actually occurs. However, PSPS does not contain any pigments, and therefore must interact with other proteins that do have pigments, where the quenching then occurs. So if we look in green algae, we see that they have LHCSR and these have the pigments where the quenching occurs. But we also know where they probably attach. So this is from uh, an mi electron microscope image. And what you can see is that LHCSR is bound as a dimer to either uh, LHC2 or to CP26. Therefore. Uh, probably the energy, the excess uh, chlorophyll excitations go from these antenna complexes to LHCSR where the energy is quenched. Now in plants this is a little bit different and mainly because PSPS does not contain any pigments. Um, however, uh, we do know what the interaction partners of PSPS are. They interact with CP29 and LHC2. Therefore, most likely also the quenching occurs in LHC2 and in CP29, because if we take away these proteins, we don't see any quenching. To give you a, sh a short summary, uh, in this video we looked at the efficiency of photosynthesis and excess light. Uh, we also looked at the chlorophyll fluorescence, and that we can actually use the fluorescence as a measurement for non-photochemical quenching, and we looked at different types of quenching, uh, especially the short-term uh, component, and in the next video we will look at the high long-term components.